Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa. And our guest tonight is here to help us understand the virtue of humility, especially at a time when narcissism is pandemic. That's what psychologists have been saying for a long time. And our guest is a Benedictine monk of the St. Louis Abbey in St. Louis, Missouri, where for the last 20 years he has taught English, the classics, and theology at the Priory School in St. Louis, which is a Catholic boys secondary school located on the grounds of the Abbey. So please welcome our guest, Father Augustine Weta. <laughs> Father Augustine, welcome. Good <laughs> Thank to you. have you. Good to have you here. And um, this is uh, a very important topic. I, I, it's something I have noticed in the psychological literature hmm. that they describe narcissism as a pandemic. It is so common hmm. and it is so uh, typically encouraged in those programs that emphasize self-affirmation and all that. Uh, at a, my own thought is, since they can't teach the Ten Commandments, the Supreme Court right. doesn't allow that in the government schools. Therefore, they teach self-affirmation as a way to assume that if I think well of myself, I'll think well of you. Uh -huh. And that doesn't work. Yeah. And in fact, one of the groups that scores highest in self-image are the sociopaths. They have zero doubts about how great they are. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this <laughs> other virtue of humility. Does this mean you have to just put yourself down and say what a bum you are and how terrible you are? And is that what, you, what, what do we mean by humility? Uh, I'm not opposed to saying what a bum you are if you're truly a bum. Yeah. And, and frankly, I mean, there's a little terrible in all of us, so I'm okay with that too. I mean, if you take the Psalms seriously, this I'm a worm and no man, then, uh, you know, I, I guess there's room for being, thinking yourself terrible or, or even bum-like. Um, on the other hand, I don't think the solution is to tell yourself that you're wonderful or you're perfect just the way you are. Because <laughs> uh, you're not. <laughs> and I've been teaching high school now for 20 years, and, and we, we had this wonderful shrink, uh, not shrink, uh, counselor named, of all things, Dr. Fury, who, w uh, who gave this wonderful talk to the school called uh, Don't Let the Village Raise Your Child. And every morning after that, I would come in <laughs> and I'd say, How am I, Doc? And he'd say, Oh, I don't know. I think you have, you have, daddy issues or something, I'd, he'd say, how am I? I'd be like, well, I think you have a, need maybe an exorcism. And he'd say, well, you're perfect just the way you are. And I'd say, follow your dreams. And he'd say, think outside the box. And we go back and forth like this, trying What's to see. The, how many cliches you can come up with. Could come up, yeah, with the best, most empty-headed, narcissistic <laughs> catchphrase that you, you'll find that people are constantly preaching to young people. And uh, so that's how I ended up writing this book on self-esteem. So what is it that you're trying to say then about, uh, the title of your book, by the way, is Humility Rules, Humility Rules. And what is it that you are trying to say with this? Well, I, I mean, I think that there's some wisdom in this ancient rule of St. Benedict uh, that flies in the face of this contemporary obsession with self uh, that could, that might do the teens a lot of good if they would, uh, mm -hmm. if someone could just and pitch it And the adults, them, maybe. don't forget the adults. That's true. I, I think, ironically, more adults are reading it than teenagers. Yeah. Uh, but it, you, it actually, uh, I had been having these conversations with this counselor at Priory for months when the, I, I ended up in a pharmacy trying to get uh, drugs for one of the old monks and there was one of these self-help racks on the yes. on the wall, and one of the books was entitled the I think the the I hope I get it wrong so I don't get sued or something, but it was called uh, 
The Teen's Guide to Self-Esteem, and the subtitle was Learning to Love the Most Important Person in the World. <laughs> and I, and I, looked at it, I looked around at the people in the store, and I was like, this is the worst advice you could possibly give a kid. Like, they already think they're the center of the world. Now you've just piled on the pressure, you know, and I went on and on, and this, I, they gave me the book and asked me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> the, something that I, I, I think is uh, very important is that in infancy, children have so little concept of the world, they do believe that they are the center. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. And maturity is learning to go beyond that to realize yeah. your parents and then extended family and siblings are all people that I have to learn to love and share with. But you start off with that, I'm the most important. Everything's about me. Yeah. And parents act that way in the first few months until the child is able to start to expand because they can't yeah. understand much more than who they are as a little infant. And, that, mm. and this is where they very gradually and slowly move out to appreciate others. And that's maturity. Making yourself the most important is reverting to infancy. Well, now that you put it that way, I wonder if, you know, there's this complaint that young men are staying boys into, like, middle age. And I wonder if part of that, I, I had never thought about it until the second, but I wonder if part of the problem is that that infancy is being extended through the teenage years. Mm -hmm. And that the parents are, are so busy keeping the kids babies that uh, naturally they end up adolescents then until they're, well, in my age. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, <coughs> present company excluded, yeah, of course. Well, yeah. <laughs> we won't. Remember, you're young enough to be my son. So <laughs> Am I? Uh, well, well beyond your age. Um, <laughs> the, the thing about no this, comment on that this, this issue of humility, yeah. how does that countermand this other development in the culture? This way that the, you know, what are you trying to say to the folks of our society about this focus on the self as the most important person there is and come to humility? Well, I think, ironically, if you take the, the view off of yourself, you end up appreciating yourself all the more. I mean, you celebrate God's image in you. I, I'm fond of telling a story about a, I had a friend at Oxford who lived in a castle. Uh, and I didn't know he lived in a castle. He invited me out to Christmas dinner with his family, and his mother came and picked me up, and we drove to his house. And uh, coming around the bend, I saw it. And of course, I'm completely detached from material possessions. But I looked at this five-story building with its own golf course and lake. And, and I went, wow! <laughs> <laughs> and his mother looked at me and looked at the castle and went, yeah, isn't it great? <laughs> and I thought, it, that surprised me even more than the castle, that, that she could accept it as a gift, you know, could really enjoy it as, I mean, I, you would expect her to say something like, well, it's really hard to keep up, you know, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or uh, well, it's not as great as it looks, or, I mean, who knows, it's some way of dismissing it, but, but I think she had real humility that was able to see it as a gift, and um, years later, actually, I, ha her, I asked her husband to come speak at, my monastery runs a high school, and, uh, I asked her husband to come speak, and uh, he had just negotiated a deal for a 19, to purchase a $19 billion business. So he's a pretty well, successful guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. And, and after the talk, one of the seniors raised his hand and said, so you're pretty rich, huh? And he said, yes, I, I think, yes, I am. And he said, but you're detached from it, right? And he said, I try to be. He says, great, can I have some? <laughs> And, uh, and I thought he had him, really. Uh, but Mr. Hill looked at him and he said, you know, I think if the Holy Spirit were, try, or, or were telling me to give away my money to random high school seniors, 
I hope I'd be detached enough to do that, but uh, it's precisely because it isn't my money that I can't just throw it around like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you can have that kind of wealth mm. and be able to see, is, how it's am I to, using yeah. this to serve God mm -hmm. and serve other people? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just passing out dollar bills is, you know, something that uh, probably is not going to be wise for the recipients of those bills. But building factories and businesses where they have ongoing work is wiser. And it's just a matter of having the humility to see it doesn't matter if I have this. Yeah. But rather that... Is this a gift that God can let me use to serve him? Yeah, and if you think about it, like throwing your money around is, a, is an act of narcissism, isn't it? And that makes you look great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's that, which is something, and this is not, you know, um, a, a comment just about uh, partisanship. It's mm. something that we have to consider when... You know, we talk about programs from the government that mm. are giving away. Is this something to win allegiances or is this something that actually serves yeah. the people best? And what is the best way to serve the people? You know, what helps them? And when, when we go to areas where people receive so-called free money, does that improve their neighborhood? <laughs> is it make for a safer place, a happier place? Yeah. Or is there not rather a need for people to find meaningful employment that they then can have a sense, I'm serving other people with this and using this gift? Well, how often do you hear this phrase, you deserve that? You know, I mean, yeah, I get frankly, nervous when I hear that about me. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> if I deserve I, anything, yeah, yeah it's probably yeah. not what I'm what I'm getting. Yeah. In the in the, been put whatever kind of spin, spin you want on that. But I, yeah, I think you're right that um, when you start giving people things, they start to think they deserve it, and then you think, and then that feeds into this this self obsession, I guess. And it also becomes something that is never quite enough. Mm. You, know, you never think that, well, you gave me enough toys. Because ironically, whatever you're giving, you, you do deserve more because you're, you're Christ, right? Yeah. I, I, um, I'm fond of misquoting St. Francis de Sales, I think, it, who said, I think, um, when you serve the poor, expect them to demand an apology. Uh, and I, I love this phrase, whether I made it up or he did, I'm pretty sure he did, Regardless, it um, w whatever you're getting, if you're Christ to somebody, they're not giving you enough I, in a way. But at the same time, they're Christ to you, so you can't possibly be giving them what they deserve. So yeah. no one ever gets what they deserve and, and shouldn't in a way. <laughs> yeah. But this, you know, one of the things I've often thought about in regards to the issue of humility is that it is not an issue of putting ourselves down. No. Because that remains a focus on me. I'm still thinking about myself. If I said, well, I'm not really good enough, I'm, not, no. yeah. I'm still thinking about me. Humility is about turning our gaze away from ourselves, first towards God mm -hmm. and his infinity. Mm -hmm. And then toward our neighbor. That's where I see humility lying. And if you keep your eyes fixed on God, you'll be constantly aware of your smallness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was driving home from an airport with uh, a fellow named Matthew Abide uh, of uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. And he, he was driving me to the school where I was supposed to give a talk. And he looked over at me and he said, you know, I had a vision. <laughs> and... I, the Benedictines, as you know, do not have visions. Carmelites mm -hmm. and Passionists, they, they have. Yeah. Uh, so I got real nervous, but I was stuck in the car with him. And he said, uh, I, 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 I thought I, I saw myself in the Garden of the Apocalypse. 
and this and the dragon appeared and I grabbed my flaming sword and went running at the dragon and St. Peter stepped out and said, give me that, handed me a pair of pruning shears and said, go prune your corner of the, dra of the garden. I'll take care of the dragon, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, think that's, I, I think that's letting God do the fighting, Let, letting, letting your superiors, as it were, do the fighting. Uh, I mean, th it's so easy to get even for me, I guess, as a monk, to get worked up over what, what's going on in the Vatican or what's going on in D.C. or what's, And these things, I think, you have an obligation to keep up to a certain extent. But honestly, to think that I'm going to have any real effect on that is self-defeating. I really need to prune my garden. And, and, and I think things will... I'll let Pope Francis and Donald Trump and Cardinal Burke and all these fellows... They can all work out the dragon business. I'll let my abbot fight the dragon. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and that's part of this humility that you're talking about here. I hope so. Mm -hmm. yeah. That it, This is something where uh, I think also recognizing, therefore, this is our area. I, in one sense, as a Benedictine, that, you know, that would seem to fit you know, the mentality. You, Unlike Jesuits, you take a <laughs> vow of stability and focusing on rootedness in the place where you belong is a very key part of being a Benedictine. Jesuits are meant to be missionaries. We're, we're on right. the move. This is, you know, our sense of mission is, is, is to have this other kind of uh, movement take place. But with Benedictines, there's that rootedness that this is the part where, I, and th this is where there's a humility about both sides, uh, or both aspects, not sides so much as aspects of religious life. Uh, and yeah. that applies to everybody else's life too, in terms of where are you called and how are you faithful to what you're doing? Yeah, I think uh, at a certain level, well, I was just thinking maybe it is your job as a Jesuit to fight dragons. <laughs> and maybe that's why we, we, we lose some of those guys in the field, because that's dangerous work. Um, our job, yeah, is, is to be alone um, and to be alone with each other, which is even harder, I guess, than being alone. Um, So humility, yeah, if you're gonna, frankly, if you're going to live in anyone's presence, yeah, humility is, is essential. And, and, that, and that's an accurate self-perception, not a, self-deprecation is not authentic humility. And uh, the, the other side of it would seem that it's not able to allow for false images of yourself, mm. neither exaggeration mm -hmm. of your abilities and how great thou art in your own eyes, yeah. how much of a legend you are in your own mind, <laughs> nor self-deprecation where you put yourself, mm -hmm. neither one of those is humility. Yeah. Humility comes from reflection that gives an honest idea of yourself and I think also requires some input from the people who see you differently than you might see yourself <laughs> yeah. in either direction. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and so this focus on self-esteem, it really ends up uh, damaging your self-esteem, doesn't it, I mm -hmm. guess? I, uh, you're, you're making me think about this in a completely different <laughs> new way, uh, which I guess is what we pay Jesuits for, or don't pay <laughs> Jesuits for, as the case That's may be. more like don't pay Jesuits for. <laughs> to get for, us yeah. to rethink our, our ideas. I was just thinking now of uh, a kid who used to, I was on the swim team in high school, and there was this kid who used to beat me every year at regionals. And every year after the race was over, he'd throw his goggles against the wall. And I always thought that was a, a, a good example of, uh, of that sort of weird, humil that false humility. Like, because uh, I'd look at him, I'd think, well, you beat me, <laughs> right? Yeah. But now, talking to you, I'm thinking, he was only focused on himself. I was the one comparing myself, wasn't I? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So that's not, so maybe he was, maybe he was not living up to his potential, in which case he had a right to be disappointed. Sure. It was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was I who was busy comparing myself. And this huh. is, this is something that I, I when it comes to. I gotta to go to confession. <laughs> <laughs> All these years. Take, take a little more time with being, getting sorry for it first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still don't like that kid. <laughs> The, the, the other thing, too, I think of the way, uh, in terms of the way we look down on other folks, you know, hmm. uh, that's a, a very important aspect of pride. And it, it, I always, whenever I think of people trying to climb to the top hmm. to become number one and become the most this or most that, whatever it is they're looking for, I can't help but thinking about a bunch of monkeys climbing to over each other to the top of a tree and forgetting that the higher up the tree you climb, the more people see your bare bottom. <laughs> and it's not pretty. Probably the, counts for monks too, as well, well as monkeys. It, it, it's anybody. You yeah. know, this is, and the stance has to be one of not trying to look down on anyone else, mm. but rather looking up towards God our Lord. And then you see, I don't worry about where any of the other monkeys are. Yeah. It's realizing the immensity, the, uh, the, the infinity and the goodness of God and that incredible uh, beauty of God. And then I don't worry about any of this other stuff. It doesn't right. matter. Uh, can you imagine John the Baptist you know, <laughs> look, climbing the corporate ladder, you know, or, yeah. you can, or for that matter, can you imagine any politician saying, well, I've got to decrease so. Uh, so that he can increase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah, it's, it's utterly opposed to that sort of, well, I was going to say that American ideal, but it's not just American. And, and and wanting to do your best, uh, ambition, well, who was it? Dizzy Dean said, it ain't bragging if you'd done it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> wanting to do your best, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I think it was Justin Martyr who said, it, or no, it was John Chrysostom who said, if you downplay your own gifts, you do God a disservice. Uh, that, that he's, since he gave the yeah, gifts, in the, gave the the gifts in the first place. Exactly. It, it's rather focusing on yeah. the giver and like you're saying about the, the lady who lived in the castle, being thankful for the gifts he gave us yeah. and being willing to use them for his greater glory, mm -hmm. not our own. Yeah, I th I've always thought it was funny how the Babylonians choose to build their tower in a valley. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, and there are mountains right nearby. Why not just start it? On, I mean, if you're going to build a, a, a tower to heaven, start with the mountain and build it on top of that. Like, it just sort of defies logic the way they go about it. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet, they, and yet, isn't that what we always do when we try to build a tower to heaven? That we, we just ignore what's already given. Uh, it's uh, they, who is it? Uh, no, it was C.S. Lewis who said we don't so much these days want a heavenly father as a heavenly grandfather. Yes, right? yeah, that's so right. That's senile right. old man who doesn't much care what the young folk do so long as no one gets hurt. Right, 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 and, right. Uh, yeah, that's um, it, it's a, a plague. And I think you said plague, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, pandemic. A pandemic, pandemic of na it. narcissism. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there was a uh, Pentecost, an old time Pentecostal preacher from South Africa, David Duplessis, hmm. who one time had in his prayer this word came to him saying, "God has no grandchildren," and he was totally perplexed totally perplexed yeah. and so he looked up and he couldn't find any place about <laughs> grandchildren in the Bible couldn't find anything about God having grandchildren. and then it was he realized what you had just said huh. that God has no grandchildren he only has children you because oh. because you are a believer it doesn't mean that your children then become grandchildren of God each generation must come to uh, understand their own relationship with God as their father. Yeah. Coasting on the relationship of their parents will not 
give them an authentic spiritual yeah. life. Yeah. They will look for someone who dotes on them, but they won't look for someone who's a father that calls them out. Right. And this is this is what fathers do. Right. Grandpa and brothers and brothers. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I, grandpa can give the kid back when it starts to leak. <laughs> you know, it starts to leak. And to take him home, he's leaking, he's crying, or whatever yeah, right. else he might be leaking at. Whereas <laughs> parents yeah. have to be there. Yeah. That is their duty. And, and also have God to the back Father off is that at a way. certain point, too, though. Yeah, the hence right the dark comes. night of the soul and all that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. This is uh, uh, something that when we are dealing with this virtue of humility, I mean, we truly don't hear it promoted a whole no. heck of a lot. Uh, and that's why this book, you said that this has sold 50,000 copies. Something like that, it, it, yeah. Which it, means that... To everyone's surprise, including mine. And that's not false humility. <laughs> yeah. No one expected it to sell like that. Yeah. But what it means is that it's touching a nerve that needed to be touched. Have you thought about what that might be? What is it that people are touching that makes sense to them? Because that's one of the things about books. Certain books come at certain times hmm. and people say, that's it, that we needed that at this time. And in this time of widespread narcissism, yeah. your book comes as an antidote. And uh, this, have you thought about what, what part of the book do you find people being touched by the most? <laughs> well, uh, the stories really at my own expense. In fact, there are a couple of stories in there I asked the editors to take out at the last minute because I was humiliated. But, um, but I, I just, as you're speaking, I'm thinking that maybe they're just tired of being so angry. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I hadn't really thought this through. Uh, probably should have before I got on television. <laughs> uh, but I think this lack of silence, uh, a, 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 a lack of, well, it is a lack of every kind of silence, of social silence, of maybe, I mean, maybe that's, the sort of hidden blessing in this modern pandemic that we've got going on at the moment that uh, the physical all, the, the virus pandemic yes this yes. virus pan yeah mm -hmm. the other pandemic the one that goes unspoken mm -hmm. um, that that it's sort of forcing us to quiet down and, and mm -hmm. distance ourselves maybe a little bit and um, I just I, I remember before I entered the monastery I could you know I'd wake up to the clock radio and I'd listen to the radio making breakfast and I'd watch TV while I was eating the breakfast, get in my car, turn on the radio, work all day, get back in the car, I'd run with my Walkman, which mm -hmm. I guess dates me, and then come back and I even had a radio in the shower. Um, and, and so I'd be able to make it weeks without, without a moment of conscious silence. Um, and I think people, maybe people are hungering for that. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, they're turning on each other. I, I was reading a book by someone recently who was distinguishing between, and I can't remember who, but distinguishing between a conversation and a debate, mm -hmm. like where you have a winner in one, and you just let ideas mix in the other. Yeah. But, but that requires, and, and wouldn't that lead to so much more generosity and happiness and peace yeah. Um, but it does require listening and listening to each other. And that requires humility. Ah, uh -huh. yes. One of the things we have to do is take a little break. Oh. We're going to come back in a couple of minutes and continue this discussion, so please stay with us.
Right now, if you would like to find out more information on Father Augustine and his work, you can go to Augustine Weta. Now, Weta is spelled W-E-T-T-A, AugustineWeta.com, and find out more about some of the things he's up to. He does a lot of speaking around the country and all. Speaking about humility. Yeah. I'm a big shot when it comes to humility. <laughs> me. <laughs> and here you are trying to teach me about humility. No, I wrote the I book on nothing. humility. I know nothing. I'm <laughs> Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing but the, the fact of my own ignorance. The, uh, one of the things you said about your book is that the, uh, some of the stories you wanted <laughs> to take out. Yeah. And in between, the, during the break, you mentioned how the, those were the stories people liked the best. Yeah. All right. Now. Uh, I knew you were going to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah. Uh, well, well you, don't, you don't give me information that's without right. expecting me to go with it. Well, and I guess that makes for good television, right, when they get your guests well, to, so I to think like bear one of my, their souls. I think like one of my bird dogs. So, <laughs> so what you got there? All right. Well, when I joined the monastery, the, upon entering the novitiate, I resolved not to have another lustful thought, mm -hmm. which lasted about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I put it off till my junior. Like, and then, even then, I, I, I was having a pretty miserable go out of it. Of it. Uh, but I read in the lives of the saints that St. Francis, well, when he has struggled with lustful thoughts, he threw himself in a rose bush. Mm -hmm. um, so, turns out our brother Simeon cultivates roses. We've got a pretty nice rose garden behind the monastery. And I thought, well, if it worked for St. Francis, it would work for me. And um, How did Brother th think about that? Well, uh, th that, that came later. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he was not amused. Uh, my novice master was. Uh, but I, uh, so I walked out behind the monastery and, and I jumped in. Um, but I neglected to take into account three really key factors. One was that uh, St. Francis threw himself into a wild rose bush, which has very small thorns, whereas the cultivated variety have really long, sharp thorns, thick. right? Yeah, thick, thick thorns. So mm -hmm. I was really, I was about halfway in when I made this realization. And then second of all, and it's counterintuitive, but St. Francis took off his clothes before he jumped in the rose bush, which yeah. is actually a really smart idea because he didn't get caught in the rose bush. And this is what I figured out about the other half of the way down was that I would never get out because every time I twisted, another thorn would embed itself in my habit. And pretty soon I was just good and thoroughly stuck in this rose bush. And, Not uh, to mention the guy, whoever, whoever it is in your monastery that is yeah. the tailor for the habits might not oh, be. Oh, well, that's, yes. Yeah. And, then, and, and then, of course, the third part that I neglected to consider was that St. Francis was a saint. Yeah. And I'm just Augustine. And so I, I used to say I was in there three hours, but I think that was only in my mind I, who knows how long i was stuck in that rose bush when my novice master walked by <laughs> yeah yeah and, and by walk by i mean he he walked he looked at me and he went aha and he walked on <laughs> i'm sorry a little help can i get a little yeah but he came back later with the rest of the community and they all had a good laugh including brother simeon god bless him uh, and they pulled me out of the rose bush and uh, gave me a new habit because, yeah, I had destroyed the habit I was wearing. Yes. And uh, as I was picking the thorns out of me in the novitiate, Father Luke sat me down and he said, Listen, Brother Augustine, before you attempt any further feats of asceticism, just check with me, you know, because we've all been there, right? And I was like, In the rose bush? He's like, No, no, we haven't done anything that stupid, but we've all done stupid <laughs> things. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I think obedience is really what, what keeps us humble, but it's also what saves us from ourselves, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because even, you know, even, even in the pursuit of holiness, even, even when you're trying to do the right thing, it can be done the wrong way if you don't consult people who are older and wiser and smarter than yourself. 
And, and this, I think, teenagers especially don't want to hear. Oh, I don't have to think. They don't want to hear it. Um, on the other hand, whenever I talk about it, it's pretty well received. Um, I mean, I think this is, uh, th this is one of the problems we come up against in, in modern, among the sort of modern intelligentsia, is that there's this cult of youth, even, even among the wise. Yeah. Uh, and for Catholics, I mean, really, obedience is where it's at. Uh, it, uh, some sort of silly-sounding rule like go to Mass every Sunday. You know, they say, well, you know, I just think that it's not, you know, and, and you can always tell the bad logic because it begins with, I just. I just I mean, it means, I didn't really think about this, but I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you my opinion anyway, which, of course, nobody wants to know your opinion if you haven't thought about it. Um, but, but in my experience, people don't quit going to Mass because they really consulted someone, really read the literature, really thought about this and said, you know, something, th this is really going to hurt me if I keep going. Or confession, for that matter. Mm -hmm. People just sort of ease out of it without really thinking, without consulting. Um, on the beach patrol, they used to tell a story, and it may be apocryphal, but it, it drives home the point. Uh, that a, a, a boy fell off. No, actually, this happened to a friend of mine. He was at the 51st Street Pier. Um, and this happened many years before. I, I, I worked as a beach patrol lifeguard for mm -hmm. eight years. Um, and um, he was at the 51st Street Pier, and a boy fell off the end of the pier. And uh, he went to go rescue this kid, and he saw the father taking off his shirt. And he said, don't go. Like, I've got this, right? And... You know, you can't blame the father, of course, for, right. for, tr for wanting to save his kid. And you can't blame him for what he did. But he jumped in and he pulled the kid into shore by his hair, which uh, anybody who knows a, a C-spine injury knows you, you swim up behind him and you stabilize the neck. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, well... He, you the, can cause the, more damage. Yeah, the child died. Um, and, and again, you know, I don't, I'm not going to blame a father for trying to save his son. But still, the point of it is that, you know, even 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 the most selfless acts, if they're not done in obedience, can See, do more harm. That's why one of the most difficult areas of humility to recognize is spiritual uh, uh, pride versus humility. Mm. That spiritual pride, I'm, I mean, I'm committed to the Lord. I'm doing this. And, and we're like that father yes. who sees this moment. My son is drowning. I got to do something. Yeah. But I'm not trained properly like the lifeguard who is on his way. I mean, it's one thing if there's no lifeguard there. Right. right. But if he's on his way and he's trained to how to protect somebody, mm -hmm. then... You know, you, you have the humility to let somebody who is in charge be in charge. And uh, right now, we're, we're, I, I see this going on during this epidemic, yeah. the, the virus epidemic, that is, where people are saying, well, they can't keep me out of church. And right. You know, well, wait, uh, or uh, there was at one point where the bishops were saying, don't receive Holy Communion on the tongue in some of the dioceses yeah. because that could be a means of passing on yeah. not just to the priest, but from the priest to somebody else. And so, and people, well, I have a right to, and, and yeah, yeah, yes, you do. Well, there's but then also there's, there's another sense of humility about mm, saying, mm. I need to pay attention to a broader picture and not just you know, my own piety. And, and again, I, in my parish, in, you know, in the Maronite Rite, yeah. we may not receive in the hand. Right. That's forbidden. Well, maybe you don't receive communion at all. Well, the, well now that's the situation. Maybe you're called to make that sacrifice. I, in the rule of St. Benedict, he says, if, the, if you're fasting and the guests need to eat, you should break your fast to eat with them. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, and that becomes its own sort of, you fast from fasting, as it mm -hmm. were. You know, mm -hmm. it becomes a sacrifice of your spiritual benefit, maybe, for yeah. the sake of the others. Um, 
You're right. And, 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 but, of course, it always keeps boiling down to humility, doesn't it? And, and this is where, uh, again, we, we can have great mo uh, true motives. We're, we're, you know, people want to receive our Lord with mm. full respect. I, I, we've oh, gone yeah. through it's a, a noble, period. noble, noble. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've gone through a period yeah. of great disrespect right. to our Lord, to the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah. But we also have to say, in this particular circumstance, if those who have a responsibility beyond my, me mm -hmm. and that they're not up to monkey business or anything, but this is about saving lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then I have to have the humility to say, this is what I will do. Mm -hmm. If that's, you know, and again, it's not in every place by any means, no. but it is in many places. And that's, there's a humility in accepting that obedience. Yeah, it's a sort of a, a silence of act. <laughs> yeah, or a, and, a, and at the same time, again, just because we have other problems too, nobody mm -hmm. can command you to commit a sin. No superior can command you to commit murder or anything else like that. But if that's not what's at stake, and it's not commanding you to commit a sin, but to do that which is legitimate, but not your own expression. Humility would be for us to accept. To obey. Yeah. yeah. It it's wouldn't. on the bishop's soul. You know, that's why I don't, nobody wants to be a bishop. And, and <laughs> it not only is his, his soul, but also to the best of his ability. I, yeah, I, right, right. I want to give the, there's another part of humility. St. Ignatius emphasizes this. You mm -hmm. give the other person the benefit of that. You assume a, a, as good a motive as you yeah. can. Yeah, yeah. This is, this, is a, this is part of our humility. You don't assume malice. When it's there, That's right. yeah. don't avoid it. Pay attention to it and deal with it. But assume as good a motive as you possibly can. When I was, you're reminding me now of another one of those embarrassing stories, but when I was, um, when I took my solemn vows, the very same year my sister got married, mm -hmm. and she asked me to give a toast at her wedding reception, and honestly, I mean, I don't have a dog in that fight, I'm never getting married, I, I like my sister, but I, I don't have anything to say, so I went and found <laughs> one of the old monks, um, I do like my sister, but my <laughs> side note, my sister and I had a competition for years to see who could be the most annoying, which I won. When oh, she, okay. good. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. I, this, this I'm actually proud of. Yes. Uh, which she's a soldier. Uh, she joined the army. My mom says uh, her daughter wears combat boots. Her son wears a dress. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when she she was sent to Bosnia, and uh, she asked me, I said, "Is there anything you really miss from home?" She said, "Yeah, the Sunday funnies." So for a year, I collected the Sunday funnies and I sent them to her in a box. But first, I cut the last panel off of every cartoon. <laughs> and, and then I said to her, a second box with all the last cartoons mixed up in it. Uh, so I, I won that one. Um, but we, my, I remember as a kid going to my dad and saying. Uh, I wish I'd thought of that a couple times. Yeah, yeah. It was, it, well, you can joke. use it. You can yeah, use it. I, uh, uh, but I go to my dad when I was, I think, seven, and she was five, and saying, you know, it's really time to give her up for adoption. You know, she's been, she's too much. And my dad sat me down and he said, you know, there's going to come a day when you discover that you like your sister. But until that day comes, fake it. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. I, I do like my sister a lot. Um, but anyway, um, she asked, so she asked me to give the to toast at her wedding. And I went to old Father Patrick, who was asleep in a chair in the calefactory, which is monkish for living room. And um, he, he was asleep, and, and so I woke him up, and I said, Father Patrick, i got to have something to tell my sister on her wedding day. And he kind of woke up and looked around, and he said, Ah, you tell her that the day will come when she will want the window open, and he will want the window closed. And then he went back to sleep. And I had no idea what he meant. I gave the toast, you know, I, and, and everybody said, oh, that's really, what, what does it mean? And I said, well, you'll just have to live your way into the answer. Yes. You know? uh, and, and this was my sort of fallback homily anytime I didn't have one. And, 
I was given a, I was given this ser- uh, I was preaching to the missionaries of charity, and uh, I forgot my sermon by the time I got up to the podium. So I just said, uh, "Sisters, the day will come when one of you will want the window open, and the other will." Want the-. And I sat down. And then I got back up again. I can't lie to a nun. I have no idea what that means. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I sat down. And Sister John Mark, they all have these great names, came up to me afterwards. And she's, she doesn't take any flack. Um, I once, dur- uh, uh, toward the end of my junior, I, I was visiting them. And I said, you know, Sister, I think I'm supposed to be a missionary of charity. And she said, oh, Brother Augustine, we are called to be invisible. You are not called to be invisible, she said. <laughs> uh, but she said, uh, she said, I know what that means. And, and she told me that she was, she was assigned to a convent in the Amazon. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were seven of them living in this little shack with two windows and a door. And every night they would come in and go to bed. And the one nun who was from the area would come in and shut all the windows and the doors. Because she was chilly at night. Well, yeah, and they and the rest of them just steamed all night long, silently praying that she'd get transferred. And after like six years, she finally was transferred, and they threw open the windows and the door, and they had this beautiful cross breeze, and they all they slept the whole night long and woke up with snakes in their beds, right? Because it turns out... She was right. <laughs> she knew what she was exactly. doing. Exactly. And she said, if just one of us... Had, had had trusted her enough to ask, not even, you know, not a, j- just to say, sister, why are you closing the windows? We would have known. We would have saved ourselves five years of resentment. Yeah. 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 And, and it turns out there's a psychological, there's a name for this in psychology called, um, called the fundamental attribution error, mm-hmm. which is that you attribute to yourself if I do something dodgy, like cut in line at the grocery store, I attribute that action to the circumstances. It's because I'm in a horrible rush, and it's an emergency, and I'm sure the other people in line would understand, and I didn't see them anyway, and so on and so forth. But if someone else cuts in front of me, it's because they're a jerk, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or I think it was uh, some comedian used to say, if it, it's when you're on the highway, everybody who passes you is a maniac. And everybody you pass is a moron. But you're the one guy who figured out the exact right speed, right? Uh-huh. Uh, because, because you know your motives. But, but it's not even sort of a moral thing. It, it, it's just logical. If you're going to use that criterion of judgment on yourself, well, as you were saying, you, 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 should ju- you, you should withhold judgment on other people at least until you find out their motives should apply the same criterion to them as to yourself. Yeah. And yeah. they may be jerks. I mean, maybe she was coming in every night because she didn't like her sisters. But you don't know until you ask. But, uh, but especially <laughs> have, having been in the Amazon, keeping the snakes out is a good idea. <laughs> You've so been in the Amazon. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and you, you definitely want to keep them out. <laughs> um, wouldn't hurt if it had screens, though. But <laughs> yeah, well, but yeah. tough screens. But um, these are some of the things that, as people read these stories, then they start to get a sense of what you're saying to them about the role of humility in life. That you don't make it all about yourself. You're right. not the only sane guy, whether everybody a maniac or a moron. <laughs> Well, it's a, it never was about yourself. I mean, there, there's no, yeah, you, well, isn't that interesting that, that you have to make it about yourself? It's mm-hmm. an artificial thing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, the world isn't about you <laughs> mm-hmm. naturally, and, and it takes so much effort and work to make the world about you. Because mm-hmm. no, for no, no one else's, may, well, your mother maybe, but no one else's world is completely focused on you yeah right and it's and that's this is something that if a large portion of the population thinks that the world is about them yeah and nobody else cares about them then then there's this breakdown that there's this the the anger and resentment there's the anger that really comes out in our culture why aren't you agreeing with me right 
Right. How dare you? And ironically, God really is sort of obsessed with you personally, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we have an old and slightly senile monk who, who loves to say that God has an exclusive love for every one of us, right? An exclusive, like when we're there, no one else in the world matters to him at that moment mm -hmm. but you. Um, and, and that's all the attention you need, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, how could you ask for more than an infinite understanding? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's, uh, see, that's the other side of in humility, you look towards the greatness of God mm. and you see his infinity and focus on that. But at this, the other side of that is his infinity loves you. That that's part of God being infinite. He doesn't have to exclude anybody else right. while he's at the same time infinitely focused on you. What a relief. He can be infinitely focused on every single one of us because he truly is infinite. That is, it's not, infinity doesn't mean that he's got a, a lot of love for you. Yeah. <laughs> it means that there's no limit to the love he has for you and there's no limit to his ability to love each other person in the world, all seven mm. billion plus. There's no limit. Right. And that reality, as well as our need to focus on him, is what gives us perspective, mm. uh, you know, on ourselves. And I, I we, you and I were talking yesterday, but uh, uh, a little bit, and uh, one, one of my, the things that I sense is that people don't laugh as much as they used to because of a lack of faith. Comedians... Yeah who come from a background of faith yeah. are funnier than the ones who are atheists. The atheists are just nasty. But the people of faith are the ones who have the greatest sense of irony because they have God, God to give them some perspective. Yeah, ironically, it, uh, St. Benedict warns his monks against laughter, and that's been a a sort of a, a problem for monks to figure out for centuries now, along with the how much wine should we drink per night. Um, yes. But <laughs> because I can't imagine anyone making it through the monastic life without a sense of humor. And, yeah. and, and yet, well, I think our Father Timothy used to say it was the kind of, that what St. Benedict was talking about was the kind of laughter that says, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. In, in the ancient world, laughter is aggressive. Derogatory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it means uh, you lost out and it's yeah. something you laugh. When God laughs at people. Um, right. Like when in God Psalm 2. God laughs, that's bad news, that's isn't bad. it? Yes. You're in trouble. You're in yeah. trouble. Yeah. But because uh, he's got that infinite perspective. And yet he created the naked mole rat, so he must, must there must be something going on up there. I honey. guess. I guess. <laughs> well, look. Um, we are coming to the end here. No. But yeah, I know. We're running flat out of time. Again, I want to encourage folks to get uh, Father Augustine's book called Humility Rules, St. Benedict's 12-Step Guide to Genuine Self-Esteem uh, by Father Augustine Weta. And go to his website, augustinewetta.com. And Father, would you join me in giving a blessing? Oh, sure. May Almighty God bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lead you in all of your ways by his peace. Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, in, in this time, it's very difficult for everybody around the world. We still depend totally on your support. Hmm. We're able to bring you programs at this time and have the mass available every day and the rosary for you to join us in prayer every day only because the network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, <laughs> and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. <laughs>